Our guest is Norman Cousins, professor of the medical humanities at the UCLA School of Medicine. For more than a quarter of a century, Mr. Cousins was editor of the Saturday Review. In 1971, he received the UN Peace Medal. Mr. Cousins is the author of 16 books on topics ranging from political philosophy to doctor-patient relations, all dealing with the health of man and the health of his society. I wonder if we might go back to that day in August uh, when the world learned of the dropping of the atomic bomb. Uh, as editor of, of a leading magazine in the United States, what was your reaction? What were your thoughts and, and what did you do? <laughs> well, we're talking about something that happened <coughs> on the calendar uh, 39 years ago, but in the memory yesterday morning. One comes down for breakfast, of course, and there's a copy of the New York Times. And on this morning, uh, streamer headlines, three deep, on uh, the atomic bomb and Hiroshima, and then the article by William Lawrence, who had been brought into the confidence uh, of the military several months earlier, and so he had a background for writing about it, talking about the development of uh, atomic energy for military purposes. And one had a feeling, or at least I did, that, that a curtain had dropped on human history and a new curtain was going up, and no one knew what the, quite knew what the new script would be. But the fact that the old play had ended seemed rather clear. And also it seemed to me that a blanket of obsolescence had been thrown over human history because they, all the things that human beings did in terms of, of a civilization uh, suddenly seemed to have validity because there was now no mechanism by which human beings could provide for a reasonably secure future. A, uh, we uh, had always lived with the habits of war, and now uh, methods of fighting war uh, represented an entirely new dimension in warfare which threatened the species as a whole. But the habits of war and the habits of thinking about relations among nations hadn't changed, and so we, we were trapped. As I say, the, uh, there was a sense that the curtain had come down on one stage in human history, a new, a, a new a curtain was going up, uh, the script for which had right. not been written. And, 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 and in essence, you sat down and wrote a, a very long editorial, Modern Man is, is Obsolete, yes. which which sold 40 million copies, I believe, or at least I, was I, seen by that I doubt that. Well, what happened was that uh, on the day the bomb was dropped, I wrote a rather longish editorial, and it had to get into the next issue of the Saturday Review. You see, in one's life, at least my life in those days, I was shaped by deadlines. And uh, it was not just that I, I had a subject to write about, mm -hmm. but uh, a, uh, a time fixed time in which to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so on that first day, I did the editorial, and, and uh, that was on a, uh, a Monday, I think. And on Thursday, it came out in the magazine. And then one of the publishers wanted to enlarge it into a book, and it went into different languages. A number of newspapers around the country had reprinted it. I don't know how many people saw it. I, doubt that it was 40 million. Mm -hmm. And and what 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 was the the your, your conclusion? I mean that 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 nation states were now in potentially in possession of a weapon that could destroy uh, all of our civilization. Well, the we conclusion think? was that the nation had come into existence <coughs> historically as a device for protecting the lives, uh, the institutions, and the property of its people, at least in those states in which property existed. 
And the function of the state had been just that, which is to provide a means of protecting the group, an extension of the tribal philosophy. But with atomic energy, no nation was able any longer to perform its historic function. And yet we persisted in thinking that it did. Uh, the form existed, but the, the ability to fulfill that particular function uh, was annihilated uh, along with the city of Hiroshima. But we continued to pursue the folklore of the nation without, the, without any of the benefits or the prime benefit that the nation was intended to give. And, and you became, or you, you may have already been, but became even more intensely a, an advocate of world government and world federalism as is a way out. And, and, uh, since I'm opposed to anarchy, mm -hmm. and since the principal danger in the world was anarchy on the world level, I couldn't um, take leave of my convictions about the dangers of anarchy, anarchy just because nations uh, created it. You wrote in the, the Christian Science Monitor a couple of years ago when, when the Saturday Review uh, uh, died, uh, my hope from my earliest days at the Saturday Review was that the magazine would help to develop a language that transcends force. That was why Saturday Review was one of the first journals to call attention to the implications of nuclear weapons. Uh, have uh, we been successful in, in creating an image of, of the bomb that uh, uh, would, would will carry us through these times? I mean, hasn't that battle been lost in some ways? No battle is really ever lost, mm -hmm. as long as you're alive. Mm -hmm. But um, the editorial, or the piece that I did for the Christian Science Monitor, <coughs> uh, was written um, six years, five or six years after I left the Saturday Review. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was asked to reflect on the place of a magazine in the society. <clears throat> but the awareness that, of the implications of nuclear energy uh, that you speak of, that awareness was not really very great. But you can't blame the American people for not understanding the implications mm -hmm. when President Truman, I think, did not understand the implications mm -hmm. of uh, the nuclear bomb. He thought of it as people thought of it, <clears throat> as a superior weapon and used it as a superior weapon, <clears throat> not recognizing that this represented a new age in human history and that the United States, which was the first to develop the bomb, had some responsibility at least to think through the implications of the bomb. But he dropped it on, the, on a living target, despite the fact that we were the only country that had the bomb. And he thought this was a quick way of ending the war, and that was the only thing that interested him. Uh, the fact that this might, through that use, thus become a source of great danger to the United States in the future and that uh, our failure to set up controls when we had the ability to do so before the other countries had the bomb. Uh, this did not figure in his thinking. So as I say, if the President of the United States didn't understand it, how can you blame the American people for not understanding it? Now the scientist <coughs> at the time who developed the bomb did understand the implications. And they begged the President of the United States not to use the, the bomb just because we had the bomb. At the very least, they begged them before using it on human beings to have a test demonstration, perhaps somewhere in the Pacific, under the auspices, perhaps, of the International Red Cross. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and uh, the effects of the bomb would thus be viewed uh, by an international agency which would report on it. And then Japan would have to make the decision as to whether the bomb should be dropped at all. Uh, we could deliver an ultimatum to Japan on the basis of that uh, test. So the issue was not whether we were going to save lives by dropping the bomb. Mm -hmm. The real issue was whether the United States was going to try to do everything possible to avoid using the bomb. If it had to use the bomb, that was something else. Uh, we never, we, of course, we no one can ever know what the reaction of Japan might be. It's quite possible that they would not have attached the same value or depth to a demonstration of the bomb as they did to the actual bombing at Hiroshima. But at least the United States would have been able to fulfill, it seems to me, the requirements of, of responsibility at that particular time. 
So we have to ask ourselves, why was it that the United States did not have a test? It can't be, as the President said, because we, um, we wanted to spare the lives of Americans that might be required to invade Japan, because Japan still would have made the decision as to whether the bomb would have been used or not. So that argument doesn't count. The only argument that really makes sense historically has to do with a sequence of events at the time. You will recall that President Roosevelt, meeting Stalin at Yalta, tried to get the Soviet Union to fight a two-front war. The United States was fighting, fighting a two-front war. We were fighting in Europe. We were also fighting against Japan in Asia. Uh, the uh, president had been under severe pressure by the American Congress and the press uh, to persuade Stalin to fight a two-front war, too. And so at Yalta, he did everything he possibly could uh, to get this commitment by Stalin. Stalin's argument was that if the Soviet Union were to divide its forces at a critical time in Europe, then we would lose in Europe, uh, and by the time they might draw their forces back, it might be too late. And so Stalin felt that the important thing was to concentrate on the primary objective, which was to defeat the Germans in Europe. Uh, Roosevelt was not unmindful of uh, the logic of this, but at the same time, he wanted a commitment by Stalin that the moment the war in Europe ended, that Stalin would use his forces to help end the war in the Far East as well. Uh, they argued on this, and Stalin finally agreed. But Roosevelt was not content just to get agreement in principle. He wanted a date by which uh, the Soviet Union would enter the war in the Far East. And it was agreed that, the, that Russia would enter that war 90 days after the end of VE Day. Now here chronology becomes important. At the time of Yalta, we did not know for sure that we would have a successful nuclear explosion. <coughs> we had some indications, but we hadn't yet tested the, a device. Now think of what happens. The war ends in Europe. The United States successfully tested its uh, atomic reaction, and we knew we could make the bomb. Uh, but we also knew that since we had the bomb, we could end the war without getting the Soviet Union, giving the Soviet Union a claim on the occupation. Now, the moment that happened, therefore, all our energies turned to ending the war in the Far East before the Soviet Union would come in under the terms of the agreement. And so President Truman did not come clean with the American people. He did not make, make it, no, he made it, he made it appear that we were trying to spare lives that, in an American invasion. But the fact of the matter was that what we were trying to do was to end the war in the Far East. We had a deadline uh, before the Soviet Union would come in fully. Now, this explains why you had the second bomb on Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. If, uh, after all, the Japan had the example of Hiroshima, but we didn't want to give, we didn't want to have any discussions about peace terms. We wanted to have unconditional surrender by a certain date. Now, this is history. This is what happened. Uh, and as I say, if the American people don't understand the implications of nuclear weapons, we can't blame them, considering what happened at the end of the war. So, so you're, really, <clears throat> you're really saying that, in this case, our leadership was uh, blinded to, to the problem of uh, <clears throat> what the bomb represented by its obsession with the, 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 the international competition yes, with the Soviet Yes, I think that we were thinking in terms of the bomb as a superior weapon and not, in effect, as a symbol of a new age in human history mm -hmm. in which we had to find an answer to war mm -hmm. other than through force, mm -hmm. where we had to find an answer to international conflict, conflict uh, through means that could ensure justice. Uh, we had to find some way of creating instruments in the world that would uh, be able to prevent war and deal with the basic causes of war. Mm -hmm. We had come to that stage in human history and our failure uh, to achieve these different means could also represent a colossal human failure in terms of the price that human beings all over the world would have to pay in a nuclear war. Mm -hmm.
in a sense, this whole period <coughs> is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a struggle over political education of the American people. And, and this, this element of, of, uh, of uh, obfuscation, deceit, uh, whatever you want to call it, by our leadership is, is a continuing thing. I don't want to sound too hard, but I mean, mi manipulation of the image by which we will see the weapon and, and how we will define its use. Well, we also have to take into account the fact that people in a position of power have to deal with day-by-day -day situations, mm -hmm. also have to deal with the reality of politics, mm -hmm. have to deal with public pressures. And uh, President Truman, as has been explained since, uh, feared that if the war ended and it was discovered that we had this weapon and didn't use it to, end, to shorten the war by a single day, mm -hmm that he would be severely criticized politically, and this would, would uh, represent a severe political loss. Uh, and it's very, uh, perhaps easy for us at this remove in history to look back and see what a responsible decision uh, should have been. Uh, but at the same time, we have to recognize that there were people at the time who did attempt to understand the full implications of uh, this new age in which we lived and who recognized the cost to the United States and the cost to the world of not exercising restraint when we're in a position to do so, and not at that time seeking to achieve controls before the Soviet Union had the bomb. I <clears throat> remember very clearly a debate I had on this subject with General Groves, who was the head of the Manhattan District Project, that being the code name uh, for the development of the atomic bomb. We had a debate at Town Hall in New York, and I was the date was 46, after the bomb was dropped. And I was arguing at that time for the United States to take the leadership in setting up controls before the Soviet Union got the bomb. Uh, General Groves thought this was absurd. He said, do you realize that the Soviet Union can't even make an Ingersoll watch, and mm -hmm. you expect them to be able to make an atomic bomb? Mm -hmm. Well, it was that curious sense that no one else could do what we could do. It, mm -hmm. was, it was not just a sense of superiority. It was a sense of dangerous narcissism. Mm -hmm. uh, we were aware of the difficulty of making a bomb. It didn't, didn't seem possible to us that anyone else could solve the same difficulties. But, of course, in a world in which you have sp spies, a world in which you have scientists, a world in which you have the example that something could be done, it was inevitable that other countries uh, would be able to make the bomb, and, and, and they did it in a much shorter time than the United States uh, said, said was possible. And then the atomic race, the atomic armaments race began. Uh, the danger to the, the United States and the world today is not represented by a shortage of our atomic bombs, but the fact that these bombs are now distributed around the world and that the atomic wars can be started and we can be drawn into, in, into such wars. We tend to think of this just as a bipolar world, the United States and the Soviet Union. But the fact of the matter is that uh, any number of things can start a nuclear war, including an accident. Mm -hmm. Now, these are the things that I think our responsible leadership should have anticipated. But in, in American politics, you see, you don't think beyond the next election. Uh, I've discovered unhappily that when you talk to people in politics about anything that hap is going to happen beyond their term of office, that a glaze comes over their eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, when you talk to senators and they talk about something that's going to happen more than six years hence, or represents about something that may happen two years hence, or present about something that's going to happen more than four years hence, it's as though you're talking about uh, uh, some extraplanetary problem. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the great problems in our society, that we have not developed a faculty for the anticipation of crisis beyond the period of those who are in office. Uh, the political requirements are such that, that they tend to think only in, in, in short term. But, but most of our important problems are long term. And this is the one great thing we have not been able to do in our society, which is develop long term perspectives. Uh, when you deal with civilization, you're dealing with the life of society that where, you, where you're, the political problems that are going to happen in the next four years are, are not the only problems that you have to deal with. You saw Eisenhower shortly before he left office, and what did he tell you uh, uh, in that meeting about his future vocation? I would had a series of meetings with the president, whom I regarded very highly, incidentally. And I think that history 
is going to give him, accord him a much higher place perhaps than he's received so far, although I see that new books are coming out, that, this, that, that the awareness of, of uh, certain things that he did uh, are becoming understood. But Eisenhower's great concern, even during the 1950s, was with the, with the worldwide nuclear arms race and the difficulty of stopping that race once it began. Uh, what especially troubled him was the fact that some of his advisors, indeed this was not just among his advisors, but you could find it in many places, people who believed that an arms race was a good idea because this would put a strain on the Soviet economy. And that one way of bringing the Soviet Union to heel would be by conducting a full, an all-out arms race so the Soviet Union would not have uh, enough resources or general means to take care of its people, and that this would apply political pressures on the government. So the arms race was used as a, as they saw it, could be used as a political weapon. This is not an idea we're unfamiliar with in today's period, I might well, suggest. Uh, not only are we not unfamiliar <laughs> with it, but uh, it's apparent that that point of view uh, has, met, has achieved its objective. Uh, the, this deeply troubled Eisenhower because Eisenhower recognized that this was an argument offered as an excuse for pumping billions of dollars into the and building up the power of the military and what he called the military-industrial complex. Uh, and uh, the people in the military and the industry were not unaware of the fact that, that this gave them uh, an open shot at the U.S. Treasury. And so uh, the Soviet Union, you see, uh, the arms race was a very good way of justifying the increase in, in power and profits, which I now recognized. And in his uh, closing talk to the American people, he tried to warn them about this. The presidency is a place that is hemmed with all sorts of constraints and limitations. I don't think the American people quite know that the presidency is really a juggling act of competing pressures. Uh, and the, presidency, the president sits at the head of the table. Meanwhile, you get all these agencies that are appointed to uh, create a basis for policy. And then you get the confusions. Uh, we think we have just a State Department supposed to make foreign policy. But in addition to the State Department, you have the White House, you have the White House desks, which deal with the same questions. And so you can have conflicts, differences of uh, opinion and therefore advice offered to the president. The um, military have their own, in fact, State Departments where they have their appraisals branch and they have their representatives around the world uh, making decisions on the basis of, of, of their own analyses. Then you have the, the CIA and the National Security Council. And so the president has all these streams of, uh, of sometimes conflicting advice, not always conflicting, but sometimes conflicting. And then you have the public agencies to deal with and public opinion. And the wonder is not that we have, any, we have a foreign policy uh, or that, that doesn't make much sense, but we have any foreign policy at all considering all of these multiple sources. So I have a great deal of sympathy for the President of the United States, whoever he may be. But at the same time, this is the job of the President. He has to orchestrate and he has to somehow keep all these balls in the air. And he has the responsibility for making these ultimate decisions and not allowing others to make that decision for him. Uh, Eisenhower had great difficulty, as he said, uh, in coping with all these forces because things would be done that would force his hand. The same thing happened with President Johnson. Uh, no matter what President Johnson tried to do to get the North Vietnamese, the Vietnamese into uh, negotiations. Uh, there are people in the field who had the power to commit the, the U.S. flag and the president had to fall in beyond it. And not infrequently in Vietnam, 
the military undertook measures under the, what they described as their field authority that limited the uh, ability of the president to make effective decisions. In Vietnam, for example, at a point where we were able to arrange for behind the scenes negotiations, at least to explore the possibility of negotiations, the military bombed uh, in Vietnam and the president himself was surprised. This happened not once but twice on the eve of negotiations which destroyed the negotiations. So a president of the United States, you see, has to cope with all this. President Johnson fell in behind the flag in both these cases. Uh, uh, Truman dealt with, president, with, with General MacArthur as he, as he believed he had to deal with it, but you do have these problems. Uh, now Eisenhower, recognizing all these limitations on the presidency, could hardly wait until he got out of office so he could speak for peace in his own terms. Mm -hmm. He was really looking forward to his retirement so that he could work for peace un in an unfettered way. And I found that rather poignant that a president of the United States has to anticipate leaving office so he can speak out for peace as he would like to speak out for peace. But there are, there are these vast aggregations of power inside the United States government, as I say, that impose severe constraints on the presidency. I, I'm not sure that we, we fully understand how severe these constraints are or how great that power is. But every once in a while, as in the case of Eisenhower, you have a specific warning to the American people. And what concerned President Eisenhower was the fact that the military industrial complex saw in the Soviet Union an opportunity to build up its own power. And indeed, wanted the Soviet Union to build up its own power as an excuse for, the, for us to extend ours. And the rationale that they used was that, well, this will build up pressures inside the Soviet Union. It's a good thing. Let's, let's force the Soviet Union to compete with an arms race. Uh, let's force the Soviet Union to spend all this money. It will put severe pressures on the Soviet economy. But what about the danger of war that that would produce? What about the dangers of an arms race? What about the dangers of accident? What about the weapons that were being produced? The fact that this thing could get out of control? What about the fact that 60, the lives of 60 million Americans might be taken in the first wave of a nuclear attack? Well, these are things for someone else to worry about, because this was beyond their time, I, I suppose, as they saw it. Well, these problems, as you say, still remain. And I hope we're going to face up to them. What, what, what creates the political counterweight to these forces that, that want to adopt such a strategy? You were uh, uh, co-chairman of SANE. Uh, uh, you've been involved in other kinds of, I mean, how do we then take a consciousness and, 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 a, and, and, and relate it to a political action that, that will meaningfully change the minds uh, of leaders who can't uh, confront these pressures? Well, we spoke before about, about pressures. The only pressure that is greater than all the pressures I have described is public pressure. Uh, this government was created, was given a design in which the underlying theory was that the ultimate power belongs to the American people. Uh, that uh, design has very rarely been tested. Once or twice it has been. I think it was in Vietnam where I think that the convictions of the American people became a political force which dictated government policy. Uh, it's happened then, it can happen again. And that has to be the hope. And when you talk about political pressure, you have to talk about, about awareness, you have to talk about language, you have to talk about the means by which people communicate uh, with, with one another and with their government. You're talking short about the processes of a free society. And this is where a free society comes into its own. This is where a free society vindicates itself. So that has to be the hope. Isn't, don't some of our leaders use a strategy of, uh, of anesthetizing people to these, to these issues? I mean, even in your book, uh, uh, your newest book on, on medical issues, you have a chapter on the dangers of nuclear war. And, and you, you remark about the words that we use for uh, our sophisticated weapons, our, uh, our MX is a peacekeeper, uh, and on and on. So there is a, there is a, uh, uh, a conscious effort on the other side to, 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 to not have this kind of political mobilization. I think it's safe to assume that the beneficiaries of the billions are not going to acquiesce 
uh, in their own diminution. Mm -hmm. I think it's safe to assume that they will use all the means at their disposal to preserve and enlarge their power, and they have billions to work with. As I say, they've got an open shot at the U.S. Treasury, and they're making the most of it. You can't blame them. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're in the position to do so, in a society based on initiative uh, and uh, aggregation, uh, they're going to, going to take full advantage. And so what we have now, I think, is a military welfare state. Uh, we don't have a welfare state for the poor, but I, th I think we have a welfare state for, for those who are benefiting from this vast expenditure and indeed are utilizing every political means at their disposal to extend uh, that particular power, which in turn can, can produce yet larger expenditures. It's so interesting that the president, whenever he talks about reductions in uh, stockpiles, always couples it with creating something new. We will do away with one weapon, but we will create two others in their place, you see. So in, in short, what this mean, mean, means is that we use arms control as a, or reduction as a device actually for justifying the extension of the arms race in, in an additional dimension. There was a, 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 a glorious moment in the early 60s when there was a confluence of public opinion uh, and political leadership in the East and the West uh, to, to stem this tide. And you were a, a very important participant uh, as a special envoy between uh, uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev and then in the effort to mobilize public opinion for the partial test ban. Uh, I'd like to talk a little about that experience. What, what stands out in your mind about Kennedy and Khrushchev uh, 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 at that point in time that, that made possible their common recognition of this problem of the bomb and the need for some sort of an agreement? Well, first of all, you have to realize that Kennedy had a little momentum from President Eisenhower, and that uh, Eisenhower never gave up on the need uh, to create, in the mutual interest of both countries, a rational basis for survival. Uh, and you recall, too, that he was frustrated in his attempt to have direct discussions with the Soviet leaders because of the U-2 incident. Mm -hmm. And we find a parallel to that in what happened in Vietnam with the bombing on the eve of negotiations, which uh, destroyed the possibility at that time of the negotiations. But at least Eisenhower understood the fact that the security of the United States and the safety and well-being of the American people depended not on the pursuit of force, but on the control of force. And so you had some momentum left over <coughs> from Eisenhower when Kennedy began. Kennedy uh, quickly was surrounded by those who uh, not only wanted to keep the arms race going, but to enlarge it for the reasons that I gave before. They, uh, the arguments that they used was that this was a good way of uh, competing with the Soviet Union, that the Soviet Union would wilt under the pressures of uh, so much demand on production, that this would deflect production from the farms and from the uh, industrial sector. But uh, Kennedy was interested not just in the welfare of certain sectors of American society that were benefiting from the arms race, Kennedy recognized the absurdity of the arguments that they were using and recognized also the great dangers involved in the production of these weapons, which had nothing to do with security. Mm -hmm. uh, because when the weapons were used, there'd be security for no one. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Kennedy felt that it was important to establish these controls. But at the same time, Kennedy was not going to knuckle under to Soviet pressure uh, on, the political, on the political level. <coughs> or, the or the world level. And uh, uh, that was why at uh, Cuba, Kennedy made known to Soviet leadership that, that uh, uh, though he believed very deeply in peace and the need to fashion approaches to peace, that uh, he was not going to allow the Soviet Union to expand indefinitely or to 
build a ring around the United States that would result in even greater pressures against us. Because the Soviet Union is trying to do the same thing to us that we were trying to do the Soviet Union. And Kennedy felt that, that uh, a dialogue with the Soviet Union had to be based on mutual recognition, uh, re mutual respect for the security requirements of both countries. And uh, after, after the missile crisis of Cuba, which threw a great scare, I think, into everyone, uh, an atmosphere existed for pressing ahead with some responsible and um, perhaps far-reaching efforts designed to reduce tensions in the world and to lay the basis for putting an end to the arms race, but at the same time doing it in a way that would not jeopardize our American, genuine American security. Uh, and it seemed that the place to start would be by putting an end to nuclear testing. Uh, an attempt was made to persuade the American people that there was no danger in nuclear testing, that there was no problem with respect to radioactive fallout. Kennedy, of course, knew that this was nonsense because he had reports from, the, uh, from within the AEC which showed that the American farms had been dusted by poisonous radioactive strontium. And that strontium was al already in the bones of, of American children. This was turning up in American teeth that were tested. And if it was true here, then it was also true in the rest of the world. And so Kennedy felt that, that this was necessary, not just in the national interest, a ban on nuclear testing, but in the, in the human interest. And he felt that uh, since the Soviet Union was involved in testing, and since the Soviet Union was also uh, uh, must also accept responsibility for what was happening as a result of the testing along with the United States, that this was a good place to begin in trying to uh, apply the brakes. Just a beginning. Nothing that could be regarded as, as uh, a massive gain in arms reduction, but just as a, a setting the stage for other things. And um, then you had, uh, I think, efforts uh, to block this. Uh, all sorts of misrepresentations were made. Uh, the negotiations with uh, Khrushchev had uh, reached an impasse over inspection. That would be the number of on-site inspections that the Soviets would permit, yeah. Yes. And um, at that time, since I was going over to see the see Mr. Khrushchev uh, on behalf of Pope John the 23rd in an attempt to negotiate the release of Archbishop Slippy from the Ukraine, who had been interned since the end of the war. The president asked me to bear, bear witness to his good faith in seeking negotiations because he felt that the Russians were very suspicious and, and wondered whether the United States really meant it. Mm -hmm. And he was realistic and wise enough to know that that was a real issue. Mm -hmm. uh, or whether we were using a talk of, uh, of uh, a test ban for propaganda purposes. And uh, he wanted me to bear witness to the fact that, that he was really serious and that indeed there was no one in government, either Republican or Democratic, who was more generally concerned about the need to make, to reach workable agreements with the Soviet Union to reduce the tensions between the two countries. And that was the, the background for the conversations that I had with uh, Nikita Khrushchev. And, and Khrushchev, when you met him, mm. uh, conveyed the same ses a sense of the pressures on him that you were just talking about our presidents, uh, with the Chinese, uh, uh, his own mm. military bureaucracy, in other words, warning not to, to reach an agreement with Kennedy. Yes, uh, uh, Khrushchev. <laughs> Said he said, I don't think that you really understand what the situation is over here. He said, the fact of the matter is that my military keeps coming to me all the time saying, saying that they cannot accept responsibility for the security of the Soviet Union unless they were able to proceed in all these directions. And that uh, testing is very vital for the development of certain weapons that the United States has been secretly testing. And that if we did have a treaty, the United States secretly would. Uh, find a way of <coughs> circumventing 
the treaty uh, to the disadvantage of the Soviet Union. The generals felt that, that uh, uh, he, Khrushchev, was being naive, even having discussions with the United States. And so you had this mirror image on, uh, of both countries having to contend with, the, with these forces. Uh, uh, but uh, Khrushchev, I think, was a genuine Russian patriot, which is to say he, he recognized that the history of his nation, and this goes back some centuries and not just since the revolution, uh, he was a, a deep student of uh, the Russian soul and not just of Russian history. And uh, he felt that, that uh, he did not want to be a party to a nuclear war. And uh, he was willing to undergo the criticism inside the communist world that he had knuckled under to Kennedy by withdrawing the missiles in Cuba. Uh, his pride uh, was not the issue. It seemed, he said, the, the only real issue was, was to prevent that war. And he said there was no doubt in his fact that the war would have started. And uh, uh, he didn't think that, that the cause of Russian history would be served by the destruction of the Soviet Union. And he was perfectly willing to uh, forego his pride, and perhaps national pride, in withdrawing the missiles. Uh, of course, the question was, therefore, why did he put the missiles there in the first place? And there you get into a different context. The context was one in which na each nation tries to get the advantage over another in a struggle, in a struggle for the balance, balance of power. Mm -hmm. And both those worlds came into conflict the, uh, at uh, Cuba. Mm -hmm. uh, the world of... Uh, of national rivalries, we try to uh, find every advantage which the Russians were trying to do, and then the, and then the world, well, you had to deal with the consequences, the ultimate consequences of that particular course of, a course of action, and then also the need to find alternative courses of action that might serve the peace. When you came back from seeing Khrushchev, you met again with Kennedy, and, and uh, you suggested uh, to him the idea of the speech at American University. He was probably going to speak there anyway, but, but this notion uh, of, of, of the need for a new era of, of detente in relations between the Soviet Well, when I came back after seeing Khrushchev, I could explain to him or try to present to him uh, the problem as Khrushchev saw it, which had to do with inspections. Khrushchev genuinely believed on the basis of discussions between American Ambassador Dean and the Soviet representative Khrushchev that the United States would reduce the number of inspections it required from six to three. Kennedy had felt, understandably, that, that he didn't want to go before the Senate to seek a treaty on something that could not be verified and had persuaded the, and tried to persuade the Soviet Union of the need for inspections. Khrushchev, on the other hand, took the position that, that uh, uh, the Soviet Union that could be monitored very easily in view of modern instrumentation from without and that uh, any explosion of any consequence would turn up on, the, uh, on this instrumentation and that six inspections therefore were an attempt of the United States to do something it couldn't do otherwise which is to get into the Soviet Union to find out other things. The American mil military bitterly resented the fact that the Soviet Union could find out anything they wished because we were an open society and uh, yet uh, we knew very little about where their military installations were and uh, we knew very little about their total military picture. And Khrushchev felt that, that he was not under any obligation to provide that information. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore the notion of six inspections seemed to him to be excessive. Well, finally, they agreed on three. And, uh, I'm, I'm, well, I've got this wrong. They agreed on the principle of inspection and agreed on three. And the moment that the Soviet Union agreed to three, we asked for six. Mm -hmm. that, was the, that was the sequence. <coughs> I must correct myself. <coughs> and uh, then after, the, after we asked for six, the uh, Central Committee of the Communist Party used this as evidence of the fact that the United States wasn't really serious. Well, I went through the sequence with the president who understood Khrushchev's personal position and felt that it was possible uh, to arrive at a limited treaty because above-ground inspections would certainly be known, 
and the underground inspections were not of the same order of consequence. And uh, at least if we had the first treaty on atmospheric tests that we might then, after establishing good faith, after a year or two, proceed to the a treaty on the underground tests. <coughs> and the, uh, the, uh, as Kennedy said, he understood the position of the old man. And then I went back there, th there again in April, and it was after that April trip that, that I spoke to the president about the fact that I thought that that the situation of the Soviet Union with respect to China was such that the Soviet Union was then at a very critical point and that this would be a very good time to try to create a, a, a seek a workable basis for the reduction of tensions between the two societies and that we ought to make a breathtaking offer to the Russians to get the Cold War behind us and uh, proceed on mutual concerns without giving up, without sacrificing our national interests. The president agreed with this. Uh, and that was the, and he used the occasion of the commencement talk at American University on June 10th, 1963, I think it was, to make this historic statement. Kennedy said in that speech, as Americans, we find communism profoundly repugnant as a negation of personal freedom and dignity, but we still hail the Russian people for their many achievements in science and space, in economic and industrial growth, in ultimate acts of courage. Uh, uh, and then he compared the Americans and the Russians by saying, we all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's future, and we're all mortal. President Reagan only very recently spoke of the Soviets uh, as the focus of evil in the modern world. For someone like you, is it discouraging that after all of this time we seem to still be waging this, this grand fight over the, these very important issues? Considering the stakes, I don't think we can afford to be despairing. Because when you're despairing, you're devitalized. When you're devitalized, you lose all your energy. And you're no longer in motion. And I think that that the proper cue is to attempt somehow to find new sources of energy to deal with uh, such aberrations. But I think that, to be fair to President Reagan, since that time he's made a number of other statements to which I would hope that we would give <coughs> emphasis. I'd much rather take the statement that the President made about the fact that a nuclear war cannot be won, and therefore a nuclear war must not be fought, and then try to hold him to that in terms of specific day-by-day -day actions. And then in terms of the kind of support that he would receive for that kind of statement, to, to recognize that, that, that uh, this is where the realities are, and then to attempt to give substance to that statement, which he has, I think, not, not done to the extent that I think that he should. Uh, but uh, we can't give up. We can't even. We can't give up on the president of the United States, and where there and where there appears to be positive signs, I think the American people should rally behind those positive signs and create as much energy as they can in that particular direction. In in the 70s, the the vitality and this momentum was lost uh, by the peace movement, in the sense that the peace movement was was not focused on the atomic issue. Why do you think that that happened? I mean, it, was, it, is, was it partly the success of the partial test ban, and, and was it also the, 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 the focus on the Vietnam War? Was that uh, uh, the, the explanation for we, that? We must recognize that uh, an entire generation had come into the world in which nuclear weapons pre-existed. And so nuclear weapons became as familiar a part of the landscape as uh, automobiles, television sets, uh, telephone poles, uh, and to be born into a world in which things exist uh, is almost to feel that they have always existed. And so the new generation didn't have that same primitive sense of horror and dread and therefore energy to do something about the problem that those of us who lived in 1945 were able to experience. And I think, therefore, that the fact that the bombs existed, that we didn't have the war, uh, 
created a, a, a sense of ease, well, if not ease, at least of, uh, of resignation. But the primitive energy that we needed to deal with the problem, I think, ran out very fast during that time. From, from your experiences, are there, are, what, what are the most salient lessons that, that, that you learned from the, the, your involvement in, in the, the earlier phases of the peace movement that, that are applicable to today's movement? Are there any? Well, yes, I think that uh, one thing that is clear is that the war has not yet begun. We're still alive. We're still in possession of our senses. We, still can, we can still speak to our convictions. We can still speak to necessity. And so long as the, as the Sahara has not yet been unleashed, it seems to me that we still have that opportunity to keep it from happening. But the notion that we can drift indefinitely is not a sane notion and not a responsible notion. And therefore, I think that those of us who have some sense of a problem and some sense of responsibility, not just to our families, but to the next generation, have, I believe, a presiding obligation to get moving. Mm -hmm. And in, in, this, in this struggle, I mean, it, it, it is an international struggle. How, how do... It's a the, human struggle. It's a human struggle. But how, how do you transcend these, these, these ideological uh, barriers that are erected by the nation state and, 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 and uh, make it so much a, an ideological struggle? What I uh, have in mind here is, is identification with peace movements in the Soviet Union or uh, the whole problem of sort of, uh, you know, this obsession with anti-communism in this country and how it tends to affect uh, uh, peace movements. Well, <clears throat> you have a notion of capitalism in the Soviet Union that is certainly flawed. The kind of capitalism that Marx described nowhere exists in the United States. And yet, the, the description of it in the Soviet Union is based on original Marxian interpretation. So they're not dealing with reality when they speak about capitalism in the United States. They really don't understand the implications of a taxing system of 53% on, on business, or the fact that government is a senior partner in business, uh, nor do they understand how the incentive system really works, or the, or the or they, they don't understand volunteerism in the United States, uh, how individual Americans type a very large, take a very large measure of responsibility for what happens in their communities. Uh, they don't understand private foundations or how the taxing system fosters the creation of such foundations which in turn have to give money away. Their, their conception of capitalism, therefore, predatory capitalism, is badly dated. For our part, I don't think we understand that, that the communism, as Marx described, it doesn't exist in the Soviet Union. Uh, the Soviet Union uses money as a medium of exchange. Uh, the Soviet Union has banks. People own their own homes, own their own automobiles. Uh, the, Soviet, the Soviet leaders like to say they're moving towards communism, but the fact of the matter is they're no closer to it now than they were 20 years ago. Indeed, they're, they're moving away from it in certain vital respects, certainly with respect to incentives in order to boost production. Uh, with respect to religion, more babies were baptized in the Soviet Union last year than in the United States. So as I say, we, 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 we have in both country, countries fixed ideas of what the other country is, and uh, these uh, slogans become battle cries, and uh, they're attached to nuclear fuses. So I think we have to be, get up to date uh, in, the, in our knowledge of, uh, of each other. But hostilities, you see, are very convenient. Uh, they're very convenient for increasing the power of certain people. And this is a historical fact. Uh, our, the basic problem in the world today is competitive national governments, which, which means that we're back where we always were with respect to war, where the national state becomes a, a, an entity. Uh, yes, we have to deal with, we certainly have to deal with the fact of aggression, because states in, in history have been aggressive and have been predatory. We have, to, we have to deal with that, but we also have to deal with the need to create new instruments, new institutions in the world that bring us up to date, that can cope with the fact of world anarchy and the need for world law to replace the anarchy. This is the clear meaning of contemporary history. But I'm not sure that there's much un understanding of the need to create the instruments of world law as the only effective means of, uh, 
achieving security for ourselves and for others. So we worked for it. One, one final question. Throughout your work, uh, both uh, uh, earlier in the Saturday Review and the Peace Movement and now in, in your health work uh, at, uh, at the UCLA Medical School, there, there seems to be this common theme of, of overcoming, the individual overcoming the sense of, of, of helplessness uh, in, the, in the face of these problems, cutting through the, the, the complexity uh, and, and, and overcoming the helplessness. Is that, is that a fair uh, way to see a common theme in, in your life's work? I think so. I think that my, uh, nothing is more dangerous in the life of the individual or the life of a nation than panic. Mm -hmm. Decisions made in panic are not good decisions, generally. And they don't take into account long-term aspects of a problem. It's a rush for the exits, and a rush to the barricades as well. Uh, in illness, one of the great enemies is panic. If someone becomes ill, am I going to die? But the, the unfair thing, of course, imposed by nature at that point is that the panic is itself a disease and intensifies the underlying disease. Uh, but what is it that produces the panic? It's the helplessness that produces the panic. The fact that we, we don't know what to do about a problem that makes us rush hither and yon. The same thing is true of, of a country. I think that, that we have to get over, the individual has to somehow get over a feeling of helplessness if the country is going to make responsible decisions. And the individual in a free society does have a specific responsibility for participating in that decision-making process and for taking a vital role because the nature of the society is that individual holds the ultimate power. And if, if the people in the free society hold the ultimate power, then they must take part in those measures leading up to the exercise of that power. That has to be our hope, that uh, we will somehow liberate ourselves from helplessness, help to immunize ourselves from panic, identify the ways in which we can participate in the big decisions of our time. Uh, if this seems too tall in order, then I think we have to say that the hopes of Jefferson and Madison and Washington and Adams and Franklin, that those were excessive hopes. I like to think that those hopes were not excessive. I like to think that they created an instrument there that will endure, but it will endure only as the responsibilities connected with it are accepted and realized. Mr. Cousins, thank you very much for, for spending this time with us, and uh, thank you very much for joining us for this conversation on the quest for peace.